Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I've Never Told You, a production of iHeartRadio. Okay, Annie. Oh, I don't even know why I'm asking you this question because I already know you have 10,000. But we're just going to say, what is your number one guilty pleasure? Oh. <laughs> well, yeah, I That's like... probably a big question since I know you've got 10,000 guilty pleasures and they shouldn't be guilty, but I think yeah. you would classify I was, them as I that. was about to chafe and be like, I wouldn't say it's guilty. <laughs> Definitely fan fiction. It's probably my number one. And also things that are related to that, like making costumes that I might wear once ever. Mm -hmm. Um, And also like re-watching Star Wars all the time and replaying video games that I've already played when I have a million other video games I should play. Right. Okay, that's fair. And you also like people playing it for you so you can watch. Yes, and then sob my little heart out. Yes, and and you (laughs) sob your little heart out. You sob very loudly. (laughs) <laughs> I know. I'm a lot of Right. I think I've had so many different, like, I would say, guilty, and I'm putting air quotes, pleasures. But yeah, a lot of them do include rewatching things. But as we've talked before, I love a good rom com. I love a good, uh, you know, easygoing, smiley, aw, isn't that cute type of movie, mm-hmm. which is surprising for my personality, I think, because I am so fairly sardonic in real life. Uh-huh. But it, it does. I do enjoy some of those things. I loved... Uh, I'm trying to think what my favorite one is. I think I actually really liked uh, About Time. Oh, I don't know that Dommel one. Dommel and Rachel, oh, you're, you're Rachel you're McAdams uh, together. Dommel. And I loved it <laughs> so much that I would watch it on repeat because it just felt... Aw. <laughs> Like a nice warm hug, perhaps. It really was. Like, and there's just enough embarrassing moments. And I guess I do love Dommel. <laughs> I, I am aware. I am aware. <laughs> so for sure, something that I think I get into. But that is a kind of what we wanted to focus and look at because I actually rewatched Twilight for the first time yes. in years. And I'm not going to lie, I was definitely one of those that got caught up in the mo- in the books. And I was like, oh, I must know, this is amazing. And then kind of looking back on it, I'm like, okay, some of the things are problematic. <laughs> Maybe I should have sat back and really thought about this, but I definitely enjoyed the hell out of it. Y'all may be listening to this since it's not going to be released till February. And yes, I'm sorry, February is a really hard word for me. So this month <laughs> is going to be really annoying for a lot of people uh, <laughs> from my stance. But yes, so happy February. Yes, happy February. <laughs> happy February. But it is still January for us towards the end of the month. It's one twenty-eight. So this shouldn't be any kind of like outdated information because we're just talking about... It'd be wild if it was. (laughs) But, of course, because we were thinking about what this month represents, and of course, Valentine's Day happens in this month, and just kind of the whole romance in the air. New Year's has happened, and, you know, people have those goals. We got to have a match Mm -hmm. before Valentine's Day. And (laughs) as I was watching things like Twilight and enjoying myself because it was funny. Like, I love it still, but it's funnier to me now in what context it is. And a little bit cringeworthy sometimes. The movie, not Mm -hmm. necessarily the book, but the movie for sure. I was like, what is this about romance? What is it that makes us, like, get so caught up in it? And we already know it's a moneymaker. It was anyways. Especially when it comes to books and, yes, songs and movies and all these things. So we kind of wanted to delve into women and romance specifically yes. to that. And of course, you know, it's kind of like the thing with the boy bands and standing. It kind of has that romantic like need to, you feel like you know them. And yeah. it brings <laughs> a lot of interest and it kind of brings people together even. And it's a money-making industry. It really is. When I started looking at some of the things that were like getting the big bucks, I was like, oh, yeah. well, damn. Mm-hmm. I should have done some of this. <laughs> <laughs> and, Still can. <laughs> yeah, maybe. No, I'm just too late. I'm tired. <laughs> when we started adding up all of the different loves of entertainment within this industry, we realized, oh my God, this is a really big topic. And oh, yeah. it turned out to be a two-parter. So yeah, this is going to be in two episodes because, y'all, the amount of information that both of us gotten is extensive. And we're also going to be talking about one of Annie's loves, 
in here, which is fan fiction. And yes, that is definitely, she went in, she was ready for this part. This was, <laughs> oh, yeah. She's been waiting been her whole life <laughs> yes. for this. I so. cracked my knuckles, cracked my neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for this part one of our broad look at women and romance, we're going to be focusing mainly on writing, so both literature and yes, fan fiction. And then in part two, we're going to look at more uh, visual mediums like movies, TV, and video games, which yes, that was me, uh, but also boy bands and the yeah. like. So like why we love some, why we love romantic music. I mean, we could, we're yeah. going to also talk about Taylor Swift a little bit. Oh, yeah. Well, see, Samantha's doing that research, so I'm, I'm like, oh, because <laughs> I'm I am kind of on the outside of this, other than yes, what I picked up from fan fiction. So I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. But yes, let's start with literature and romance novels. So masterclass.com defines romance novels as, quote, a work of extended prose fiction with a theme of love. And according to the Romance Writers of America, it must have, quote, a central focus on the development of a romantic relationship between two people. And that it must also have an, quote, emotionally satisfying and optimistic ending. Huh. Very interesting. And though we will be talking about the steamy or sexually explicit romance versions, sex is not a criteria for a novel to be classified as a romance. And though romance can be found in any book, that doesn't necessarily make it a romance novel. I also want to add in here, it's probably pretty obvious, but we're not talking about pornography <laughs> necessarily. And also you can see our Women Heart Monsters episodes for more on that kind of like women and Bigfoot romance novels, because we're going to talk about that a little bit. Right. <laughs> According to an article by writingcooperative.com, if there is 50% or more of the book that centers around a romantic relationship, then yes, it is a romance novel. Right. So again, Masterclass has an option where it teaches you how to write romance novels, by the way. Um, we're not sponsored by them. <laughs> it just happened that they had a lot of information. So according to them and the uh, Romantic Writers of America, there are two types of romance, which is category or series romance and single title romance. The category is a series romance or, quote, numbered books that are released in intervals, usually monthly, and they are in sequential order. And then single titles are not necessarily standalones. They can be, but are not sequential and can be connected to other works or characters that the author has, but typically not delineated titles. And we also are going to talk about some of the subgenres, but there's a lot, which include historical romance, romantic suspense, paranormal romance, science fiction, and more. And we're going to jump into them a bit more. But before we do, we do want to talk about the history of romance novels. Yes, because uh, there's a long history there. They're not new. There's definitely been some growth and change, and romance novels have made a lot of money, also stirred a lot of uh, feathers in their day. Mm -hmm. The first published works of romance novels date back to the 18th century, and some of the authors include the Bronte sisters, Jane Austen, and Samuel Richardson, and Anne Radcliffe. Oh, and fan fiction, fun fact, Samantha. Yes. Did you know that Jane Austen was one of the first authors to have fan fiction? Uh, they were called Austenites. And she actually liked it. A lot of other people at the time were like, oh, trying to steal my work. But she was like, yeah, cool. She was all about <laughs> letting women uh, work or, or make up stories. She liked that. Yeah. But okay, the, more on that later. <laughs> Jumping ahead. Of course, most of these works um, were stories of heterosexual white women who were fighting or struggling some of the social norms or overcoming their circumstances, things like that, and then were ultimately rewarded with a good husband and a good future. Right, and we should also know that, that of course, there can be romance novels and romance stories found in the Greek era as well, but I don't think it's noted because there's not necessarily authors that we know of. We know there's adventures and there could be romance perceived in those as well. A lot mm -hmm. of the Greek mythology could be romance, but that was not necessarily centered as right. a larger story. So again, romance novels have been around. Yes. Romance stories, romance novels. It's I mean, we had to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> or else this would be the, the whole show. Right. As we move on to the 20th century, we are introduced to a revitalization of romance novels like Gone with the Wind and Rebecca, which leaned towards the more gothic romance novels, which is uh, like a bit of horror splashed in there with the romance. Yes, yeah, so you gotta have some good thriller moments. Mm -hmm. But then we move to the 50s and 60s, which takes a bit more of an exotic turn. And when I say that, 
I meant places. We have a shift with roles leading women who are career focused, careers such as nursing and being a stewardess at that time. And of course, more traveling and exotic locations. And then as we go up to the 70s, we have a bit of a modern turn as gay romance actually becomes more popular or at least more accepted. Um, and the first best selling gay novel was written by Gordon Merrick, uh, and it was called The Lord Won't Mind. And it was published in 1970. And of course, it should be mentioned that queer romance novels have been around even before then, but as expected, was overshadowed or shamed for its content. And even till today, even though it's a little more accepted, it's still not as widely accepted as your heteronormative cis white women mm-hmm. being the main character yeah. focus. And while we're talking about the 70s, we couldn't forget the beginning of a new subgenre known as the bodice ripping genre. Kathleen E. Woodywiss published The Flame and the Flower in 1972, which started the bodice-ripping genre. Now, this was specific to the type of stories written, which often included sexually explicit historical fiction. And yes, these usually included women who were virgins, but headstrong and independent who attracted the attention of the alpha male that wanted to seduce, tame, and dominate her. The earlier narratives usually included some type of abuse or rape within the stories, but have eventually evolved to no longer promote such plot lines like that. But obviously, those kind of influences do still linger. Right. And we can see that with things like Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. And although, again, it's consensual in that book, but it definitely still leans to that idea and concept and desires. And though Woody was was the first to be recognized, many authors are well known for Stevie novels. We know them. Jackie Collins, Danielle Still, and Nora Roberts, who are still pretty popular. And I know them. I don't know if I've ever read any of their books. I think I've actually read a Nora Roberts book. I think I found a copy of one in my friend's mom's bathroom. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely remember those times of seeing uh-huh. the shelves and rows of it. And I was like, what is this? As a pre-tated, yeah. pulling it out. I'm like, oh, ooh. <laughs> and I will say, I may have thumbed through to find the sexy bits. But man, oh. you know, but I think that's the only time I've ever read her stuff. And they are, again, popular. And along with the famous authors, HarperCollins Publishing established a new division called the Harlequin Publishing. And I know that's familiar to everyone. Uh, They actually started out in Canada and started buying out all these other publishing companies to distribute through the Harlequin Publishing House. And associated with Harlequin is the one and only, because I I, I love it, Mr. Romance Cover, Fabio. And if you don't know who I'm talking about, I'll be very sad because you need to know who I'm talking about, which is he's an Italian model who is tall, always shirtless, and the wind blowing in his Uh long blonde locks. Yeah, very square jaw. Yeah. Also been in Sharknado 5. He played the Pope. Did he? Okay. Oh, so yes. he again, he's really popular and he landed commercial deals. He landed even his own book deal. I actually owned one of his books. Oh. Which was an amazing garage shell find. And I was so proud of it that it became a part of one of my favorite Halloween costumes. We're not gonna uh-huh. talk about what it was. <laughs> But I would carry it around and read it out to people as a part of my character. Oh, that's awesome. Loved it so much. And then I lent it out to someone. I never got it back. And I've been so upset ever since. Because, I mean, it's a Fabio book. That's tragic. I'm sad for you. And, you know, there's a special part that you found in the garage sale, too. Like, you could go get another one, but it wouldn't be the same. No, like, I didn't know Fabio had his own books. Yeah. Of course, it was Fabio with so-and-so. Like, it definitely Mm. was that. But he was the center male protagonist hero in these books. And man, I have fond memories of that book. Just being able to go around and read it with people. (laughs) I will say, I suspect that... Fabio is one of the main reasons we're doing this episode, listeners. Samantha kept bringing him up. (laughs) I mean, you can't talk about romance novels, especially those quintessential romance novels, without knowing exactly who Fabio is. And as in fact, there's a blog specifically that I went to, and she was talking about when we talk about Fabio, what we talk about when we talk about Fabio, and trying to turn the phrase of like, okay, not all romance novels are based on him or like <laughs> him or the ones with him on it, trying to, you know, talk about what romance really is and how, you know, great it can be. But yeah, that's what I know. <laughs> well, I'm happy we got to touch on it. 
And as we do approach the more modern level of romance novels, we can talk more about diversity within these genres because it's not surprising to see how little credit or attention, unfortunately, uh, that is given or not given to marginalized writers and authors who have been involved in the romance genre. Yeah, specifically to Black authors, the more recognized authors like Beverly Jenkins, whose novel Night Song debuted in 94, and Alyssa Cole, who is more of the modern writers of the romance genre. However, Black romance authors can be found in the 19th century, uh, such as author Frances E. W. Harper, who wrote Iola Leroy in 1892. And just in case you're wondering the plot, because I definitely was like, I need to know what this plot was. Mm -hmm. The book centers around Iola Leroy, a woman who is multiracial. So she is described as being one-eighth Black and then white because at that point in time, essentially, rape was happening within those uh, enslaved communities. And however, in this specific relationship, she talks about the fact that her mother was white passing, as they stated, and she and her family were white passing. And her mother and a white man fell in love, got married, and did all these things. After the father died, his sister, I believe, ends up selling them into enslavement. And Part of the beginning of the book is pretty much uh, people who came together as the abolitionist movement and uh, joining the Union. And in that, the Union Army came and rescued Iola from her enslavement in North Carolina and take her away. And during this time, she becomes a nurse and she reunites with her family, finds a love interest, and finds her identity as a Black woman in this time and in this era. And she progresses with a lot of the characters within the book in fighting for rights and equal rights and or uh, equal opportunities. And so it definitely tackles issues of biases and racism and the and, and the idea in the even progressive areas into her leading into finding love and success and reclaiming their own land and finding their HEA, which is called Happily Ever After within the romance context. So it's a really interesting book. And I do think that that's something that we need to talk about is there's a lot of specifically Black f- female writers who kind of take it back to civil rights time and era to talk about the history, to talk about the atrocities. But at the same time, it's not focused on that. It's focused on finding love and heal. And again, like the happily ever after, bringing it into a different light. So there's this conversation that Black women will not enjoy it as much, even though a higher number of Black women are likely to read literature, not necessarily romance novels, because it's so directed towards white women, but that are likely to read it and in a part of readerships that they will not like historical fiction because Black history in America is ugly. So there's this level of connotations of what this could mean. But the fact of the matter is, it also ostracizes and alienates Black writers so that they are not able to be a part of this community, which it should be filled with this community and talk about stories like this. So it's an interesting concept. It's just now being addressed within the romance novels, and that's really unfortunate. But yeah, this one story, I'm pretty interested. I want to go back and pick it up, too. I know we've talked about uh, authors before and novelists and fiction writers before, but this is definitely a different context And knowing that it was published in 1892, Mm -hmm. and we haven't really talked about it enough. Oh, yeah, man. Romance novel recommendations. (laughs) Send send them in. (laughs) So now that we've talked about the history, let's talk about why this genre is so successful. So not surprisingly, women make up 82% of the readership of romance novels, according to Romance Writers of America, and the average age of readers ranges from 35 to 39 years old. And also, not too surprisingly, the majority of readers are white, 73% of them, and heterosexual, 86%. Yeah, and as we look at the history of the romance genre, a large majority was written specifically to that certain circumstance. For example, both Jane Austen and the Bronte sisters often wrote in defiance of the current ideas of courtship and beauty and societal expectations, which allowed for women in that time frame to imagine being able to have the ability to live that openly. So you have definitely one of my favorite books is Persuasions by Jane Austen. And the main character is not known for her beauty. Don't get me wrong. She's not ugly, Mm -hmm. but she's not known for her beauty. And the way that kind of story unfolds, of course, she finds her man who ends up being rich. But at that point, I didn't know. Like, it's just uh-huh. a whole thing. <laughs> and of course, the circumstances, the fact that they are all women, there's no men, and or the men have taken away money from them, and or they don't get the inheritance, and what does this look like? But everything works out in the end. And then also Jane Eyre is that same line. She's not a pretty woman at all. But mm-hmm. there's, and there's this, the gothic element of something hiding in the attic, 
but everything works out just fine in the end because he's blind. All good. <laughs> oh. Right? <laughs> oh. And she's dead. And the ex-wife is dead. <laughs> oh, wow. Spoiler. Okay. Have you never read this? <laughs> no. You've never read Jane Eyre? No. Huh. I've read Wuthering Heights for, for school. Wuthering Heights? Yeah, that's a good one. But it's a little different. Also gothic. I, yes. Heathcliff. Yes. Oh, Heathcliff and Catholic. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Would you say uh, most of the writers are female as well? Or women? Yes. Yes. So when we go later on in the statistics, it actually shows like I think 82% of them, 82% of the products and production and the writing all are women. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm going to come back to that later because I have a thought. Thoughts. But <laughs> we can watch the transformation of these ideas as we hit the 50s with the desire for travel or going outside of being the dutiful housewife and what a life of exotic adventures and independence would be like. As Helen Taylor, professor at University of Exeter, wrote, romance novels have, quote, an escape element of reading, which could be, quote, equated with secretive indulgence in sweet things, the easy palate-pleasing power of the forbidden. And romance, quote, allows a declaration of independence. Yeah, she goes on to talk about how it's not something that the reader, women, think they are going to get or is attainable, but it's all about the idea that they can, for a moment, walk away from their normal to something fantastical. She kept comparing it to foods and junk food and just binging on something that's not necessarily the most Mm -hmm. healthy, but really satisfying for the (laughs) moment. But the other appeal of this type of genre is the mass amount of content that is written and produced by women. It's literally created by women for women. And though we talked about this earlier, it's obvious that they're more notable or well-known or geared toward the white cis female. It is changing as more and more representation is being seen as we see up-and-coming authors are able to deliver diverse content and are getting the recognition they deserve. And as many articles will point out, it allows for women to be the more three-dimensional characters instead of being just killed off for the plot line and who are more likely to lead the story. And if you look closely at the more recent stories, they allow for the reader to be the heroine. So they don't describe them in as much detail. Like, they give you a small uh, description of, like, she's this way in her personality. She's shy. She's demure. She's this. She's... Like some of the white, she's a little chubbier. She's not a perfect woman. All of these mm-hmm. things, which allow for like how many women see themselves. Like, I'm not perfect. This is me. I'm awkward. I'm shy. Oh, yay. So they get to be that leading heroine while being able to safely take risk with that mysterious or ideal partner that they've been looking for or fantasizing about. Right. And the industry is a multi-billion dollar industry and it outperforms all other genres on a consistent basis. In 2016, romance made up 23% of the overall fiction market. The production workforce is made up of 74% women, according to a 2015 publishing weekly survey. And in fact, in 2017, romance and erotica were the top earning genres with the incredible amount of $1.44 billion outgrossing all other genres. Right. So yeah, the production and the writers are mainly women. And it's pretty fascinating to see, which also we're going to talk a bit more about just right now in a few seconds about the shame factor. Why are their works being so looked down on? And why Mm -hmm. do we have this cringeworthy effect when someone talks about Harlequin novels or uh, romance novels? Again, Mm -hmm. as we just said, when we talk about romance novels, we know there's stigma that surrounds it. When we talk about romance novels, it gets referred to as trashy novels or my guilty pleasure or bodice ripping novels or horny house wife novels, or even just porn, as some uh, people would say. And it's often used to shame readers for their choices of romantic novels. And as most things we talk about, one of the reasons for this shame factor, of course, is misogyny. The mere fact that this genre, again, one of the highest grossing genres in literature and fiction, is created and produced and read mostly by women and gender non-conforming people often places a shaming connotation to the point that romance writers will often use a pseudonym in order to separate their other works from these types of novels. We can delve into the fact that disparaging these books is associated with women who are oftentimes uh, controlling the narrative and even using sexuality or the desire for sexuality to push the story forward with a fairly detailed counterpart within the stories. So you have like actual understanding that this is something I fantasize about. I won't get it, Mm -hmm. but this is what I'm thinking about. You know what I mean? Right. 
And within these stories, they're able to attain them or to get with them. And, and they are, they fulfill every bit of the fantasy that they hope for, unlike right. reality, uh, which is still judged and shamed by many of people, which is why sites and blogs and podcasts like Smart Bitches Trashy Books are really popular because they actually do talk about the connotations behind it and why it's okay to love what people would refer to as trashy books and why they should be of notoriety because they are doing something big and they have done something big. And these books are, surprise, surprise, for women (laughs) and for those who love romance novels. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure we'll probably touch on this when we get to our, like, movies TV one, but you can certainly see that play out with, like, the love of The Bachelor or Bachelorette. And then my point that I was going to make earlier is um, I I think as a society, we've just so long been afraid of female sexuality. So that's part of it. And like even going way back into like the 1850s, there's this really hilarious, sad passage about don't let women get their hands on romance. Mm -hmm. Their cheeks will flush. There'll be like a fire inside of them. They'll be uncontrollable. And then on top of that, just because women are doing it, I think it's seen as lesser because women are seen as lesser. Right. And men want to get like the more academic, highly paid genres. They want to dominate those things. Right. So I think that's part of it too. Absolutely. Um, And you will see a lot of like direct publishing. I I have a coworker, an old coworker who wrote romance novels and she loved it. And she would directly uh, publish through Amazon. Mm-hmm. because that was one of her passions. A friend of mine read it said it was really good, so <laughs> There you go. <laughs> um, but we did want to talk about some problems in the industry where it's still lacking, because especially when we look at representation, it is behind. Um, it wasn't until the 90s that Black women were being recognized for their romance novels, and it's still not being recognized or really publicized today. In fact, the much-coveted Rita Award, which is an award to promote excellence in the romance genre, was criticized by the lack of Black or LGBTQ plus nominees or winners. It wasn't until 2019 that the first Black romance novelist, Kennedy Ryan, won the award. And it was so bad that the 2020 Rita Awards were canceled due to so many candidates and judges withdrawing because of the diversity issues. Right. So they had to revamp the whole award. I think they call it the Vivian Award now. Um, And I'm not sure if they've awarded anyone because it was so bad and it was such a tarnished reputation and it caused a debate within that organization, much like what we see everywhere else, of uh, some white women standing up saying, well, it's just because it's hard to write novels and not everyone can get awards. So justifying it that way instead of looking at the problem of, or you are not willing to recognize the excellence of Black writers and LGBTQ writers and therefore you have a biased idea of what is good and what is recognized. And they talk Mm -hmm. about specifically Alyssa Cole's book, An Extraordinary Union, which was a novel about interracial relationships during the American Civil War was a huge success. It was on everybody's top lists and talking about how big it was and how novel it was and how amazing it was written. It made no appearance during the Rita Awards finalists. And that's kind of the straw that broke the camel's back of like, okay, here's an obvious winner mm-hmm. and you are not recognizing it even as a nomination. And it was so problematic that it became a whole thing, which I'm surprised it took as long as 2018. Yeah, but I guess wow. it's the same time as Oscar So White and all of these awards mm-hmm. So White. And this is exactly one of the big problems is that even in a genre, much like the suffragette movement, was specifically made for something that is marginalized anyway because they are all women, they still ignored the even more marginalized of Black women or the LGBTQ. And so it became a whole thing. They made an apology. They revamped the thing. But we'll see, because like I said, there was an inner conversation where some people said that some of the board members did not understand why it was a problem. Mm -hmm. And that's Mm -hmm. really saying a lot. And within this industry, that's really saying a lot. But speaking of bettering I guess, the industry. (laughs) I did want to talk a little bit about YA novels or young adult novels. And though they're not necessarily a romance genre, it can Mm -hmm. be, as we know, it's given more hope to having more representation within romantic plots and romantic novels. As YA novels are written and specifically target younger audiences, aka the young adults, (laughs) adults have enjoyed and continue to read the content as well. And a big reason for that is the level of relationships and community within these books seem to offer a lot more and a lot more representation. When we look at dystopian books like Hunger Games or fantasies like Twilight, the romance is very clear and enticing. 
Yeah, I said it. I love how it's both like one woman and two dudes. You've got to have the Yeah, I didn't even think about that. The There's choice. a triangle in every single one, isn't there? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I've talked about this before. There's always the triangle. Is divergent the same way? Divergent is not the same way. They only have one. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's the no one, idea. I think. But unlike the traditional romance books, there's more representation, like we said, and a complex development as we watch characters grow and mature. So they learn about themselves as they develop. And that's kind of the appeal is that you see them at a young age and kind of that, oh, I wish I had this mm-hmm. in my younger age. And don't get me wrong, we had really good novels as teenagers, but it didn't go to this. Like I had Fear Street. What did you read as a teenager? As a teenager? I also read Gone with the Wind as a teenager and Les Mis. And Harry Potter. <laughs> oh, see, I wasn't a teenager at that point, so there you go. I think for me, it was like Fear Street, Babysitter's Club, oh. Sweet Valley High. I guess I was a little younger for those. Oh, I read a lot of Christian novels. I did read a lot of Christian romance novels, and that's also an industry that's pretty huge. As in fact, the woman that I was telling you about that wrote her own mm-hmm. novels, it was a Christian mm-hmm. romance novel. And I will say, those were problematic. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and and that's something like I know uh, me and Bridget did an episode once on like stalking 101 and Twilight, like Edward is, he fits a stalker. Like right. that is stalking. Well, he's sitting in her bedroom without permission and watching her sleep. So that's super creepy, y'all. Super creepy. Yeah. I mean, I think that's telling of what you think of of romances when you're younger, especially. Yeah. But I think that's part of the thing is like you start seeing growth because that was, these are a little dated, obviously. It was like <laughs> 20 years ago. Was it 20 years ago? I was in college when the first movie came out. So uh, that would be like 2012, 2011. Okay, so 10 to 20 years ago, this was happening. (laughs) And so that's definitely gotten problematic. But you start looking at books like Eleanor and Park, which is one of my uh, really nice little books. I was like, oh, this is nice. I really wish I had that representation. Not only do you have an Asian male playing the character of the cute boy, you know what I mean? But you have that awkwardness that they grow up together. And it's a really fulfilling book, even though it still had the conversations of abuse and like poverty and body shaming. It definitely had all of those things in there. And I think it's nice. But I do see a lot of change. And of course, again, there's bigger changes in the romance novels for adults. But these YA novels are able to do something that's a little different in developing these young characters into adulthood. When they come of age, they do add that diversity and representation, especially with like the LGBTQ and within like racial issues. They do have those conversations and are able to hit those topics. Yeah. And and perhaps unsurprisingly, many of those young adult books are authored by uh, more women and gender nonconforming individuals and are more likely to be read by adult women rather than adult men. I remember that whole thing where you could get like a fake cover for your Harry Potter book so people wouldn't know you're reading Harry right. Potter because like, heaven forbid. With genres like young adult growing and increasing, we do see more voices and representations, which does make it more accessible for those hungry to see themselves represented. And speaking of, it is time to talk about fan fiction. But first, <laughs> we got to pause for a quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So you knew that I had to talk about fan fiction. We just had to, especially since Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey started out as fan fiction. So did a lot of, I I mean, not a lot, but several other books you might be surprised to know. Um, And you can see our fan fiction two-parter for more. But as a reminder, there are millions of fan fiction out there. Most fan fiction is written by women, girls, and gender nonconforming folks, queer people, and other marginalized groups. And a lot of what is written does involve romance, a lot of it. And I would say is romance in genre. We're going to run through some of the main tropes that you'll see. And I know I probably don't need to explain, but in case you somehow have no idea, these are just stories people write about existing fandoms or works. So you just write what you want to see these characters from Star Wars do in your own world. And then people read them and comment them on them. And there's a little community there. Or a huge community in some cases. A huge community there. Huge, huge. Yeah. And disclaimer, there is a lot of problematic fan fiction and tropes. But I do think fan fiction is a space where younger folks and even older folks are uh, working through their thoughts on sex and trauma. And I also think that it's a reflection on anxieties or feelings around sex that a lot of girls and women harbor, including the confusion around repression and asking for what you want and how that struggle sometimes comes out at the usually male character displaying 
abusive, controlling, and or stalkery tendencies and steering all aspects of the relationship. Even if it's painted as romantic, he can't help it. He can't help his desire. He can't live without you. Everything he does, he does for you. That kind of mentality that shows up a lot. And to reiterate, for better or worse, I learned a lot about sex and romance through fan fiction. And I am not alone. I know that's true. Yeah, that kind of whole genre, because there's definitely columns out there where people say, I learned about sex in romance novels. Yeah, yeah. And I highly recommend, I mean, if you're interested at all, there are hilarious articles about fear-mongering around fan fiction and about, like, young girls are writing erotic sex scenes between men. Oh, my God! (laughs) That's a very simplified take and not really accurate. But, so from AO3, our archive of our own, which is one of the biggest fan fiction sites, it's a nonprofit. Quote, an overwhelming majority of fan fiction is written by people who identify as women, more identify as genderqueer at 6% than male at 4%, and only 38% identify as heterosexual. When AO3 was first coded, it marked the biggest majority female independent coding project. And I did find some amazing graphs about who's writing and reading fan fiction. Ships, which again is relationships, who, who do you ship, who do you stand behind? all kinds of stuff. And I went through the top 50 most read Harry Potter fan fictions and I've read about half of them and that was pretty cool. I was like, oh yeah. (laughs) One of my favorite tropes among the over 7,000 respondents was the friends to lovers trope. So that was one of the most popular. Um, Rescue Mission was fourth. That's another one I love. And then Fluff, Hurt Comfort, Mutual Pining, and Huddling for Warmth were in the top 10 too. And I love all of those. Huddling for Warmth. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. So that, that would be like in Hoth, I've told you. Yes. They're in the tent. It's true. Luke and Han, they've got a huddle for war. Right. <laughs> well, okay, it's not fan fiction, but I'm thinking about the Game of Thrones incident with Snow. Oh, yes. And just the saying, Game of Thrones incident. <laughs> I'm just saying, it's the incident. Yeah, so I obviously didn't contribute much to this, but I will help read through them. <laughs> so Slash, yeah. I guess we have to start there. That's what you told me, because we're going to yep. have to start there. Because while this is an episode on women and romance, the fact remains that while most fan fiction is written by women, girls, non-binary folks, a very decent chunk of it is what is called Slash, usually a non-canon relationship between two men characters and two female characters is called fem slash which you did tell me about this you had to explain all of this to me <laughs> and most of the slash is written by women depending on the site it's about a 50 50 split between straight and queer women writing it and a popular misconception is that all these relationships involve sex which isn't true which is nice no. to know no not true at all And I did want to mention Yayoi, which is manga-based slash originating in Japan. And it usually features two male characters, but one typically fits the traditional masculine role and the other the traditional feminine role. Japanese fan fiction should be its own episode, but I'm aware of it. And I know going through this, it might be kind of strange because yes, it is women in romance and all of these, a lot of these are about men, but it's women writing them. And it's, I'm going to make the case that it's exploring sexuality. But so there are a lot of theories And yes, fear-mongering as to why so many women are writing Slash. And I myself have several theories I've thought about this because I've even done it. And I'm like, what is happening here? Here are a few theories. So number one, there are more male characters, more complex male characters, and more main male characters in our entertainment. Because we have a tendency to sexualize the female body, almost any female character, and usually there's only one or two in a lot, our main ones in our entertainment, almost inherently become a love interest. This means when writing friendships with main male characters, this friendship might be deeper, something like the bromance. And because of that, and our love of turning things into romances, we might see something platonic and loving and imagine it as something else. One of my favorite pieces I've ever read about this was specifically about the male writer's shock at how many women turned Captain America, the Winter Soldier, into, quote, a homoerotic subtext. <laughs> I love it. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So the female body is, of course, more political and comes with more issues like pregnancy or, again, our own hangups around female sexuality and beauty standards. In a strange way, it removes the male gaze. A lot of these also deal with the male character's internalized homophobia, which I think is really funny because, yes, I definitely watch Supernatural. And it has a giant, giant fan fiction base and a lot of fandoms and a lot of slash. And they refer to it as well within the series. And I know one of the things they talked about is the slash. And it's quite Mm -hmm. funny how they deal with it, especially when you have a character as masculine as Dean trying Mm -hmm. to be like, what, what? So it is Mm -hmm. fun to see it played out. 
Oh, yeah. And we're going to talk uh, about him specifically. And actually, there's a whole article written about that and how that show had to become more progressive because of its female kind of slash loving audience. <laughs> right. So over at the Hi Hat, Melissa writes that Slash gives the author the chance to, quote, have the freedom of being male in their female bodies. There are plenty of opportunities in media for men to explore their sexuality, but that's not the same thing for women and queer folks. And then Slash as Queer Utopia, which is the research paper by Dr. Ika Willis out of the University of Bristol, there's a quote from that that says, the reader has to decide not only what readings of the show are possible, but what is possible in a fictional universe. And this decision must necessarily engage what she believes is possible in her own universe. Yeah, or simply, these relationships are more interesting and people want to write them or to expound on what viewers, readers saw as queer subtext in shows. And yes, again, this is also another term Annie had to teach me, which is ho yay, which I want to say is ho yay, <laughs> because it's a homoeroticism, yay, as coined by the Angel fan base. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and according to Sci-Fi Wire, some of the key historical slash couples are Spock and Kirk from Star Trek, Starsky and Hutch, Frazier slash Ray Five from Due South or Ray V. I've never seen that show, so apologies. Uh, Clark Lex from Smallville, Sherlock Watson from Sherlock, and Finn Poe from Star Wars. I could probably talk about Slash forever, and I propose we do a whole episode on the history of Slash one day. Okay. But all right, Impreg is something I wanted to mention because just to note, there's a whole section of fan fiction called Impreg wherein main male characters do get pregnant. Okay. So or die. And I was really yeah. excited to see this. The first slash fan fiction is thought to be a 1968 Spock slash Kirk, which is Spurk fan fiction that was a f or die fan fiction. You have to have sex or you die. And in this fic, the characters, quote, spend all of their remaining days on the planet exploiting both the planet and each other's bodies. Ooh. Mm -hmm. Which simplifies a complex situation of feelings and worries to, we have to have sex or we die. Yeah, and it's especially useful for, like, if two characters probably wouldn't have sex, how do you put them in a situation where they would? <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> yes. And then shipping, which we've talked about before. Fan fiction is a big place for shipping, especially for characters who are probably not going to get together in canon. Some people argue that that's what shipping is. It implies that the characters aren't meant to be together in canon. And Destiel, or Dean and Castiel, has the most fan fiction written for it of any ship, at least according to numbers that we can find. As of 2019, AO3 put this ship at number one with 79,650 stories written, tagged as Destiel. And there could have been plenty more that weren't tagged or were differently tagged. Uh, Bucky and Steve are Stucky, was fourth. Dean and Sam, or Winzest from Supernatural, was ninth. And Jensen and Jared, the actors from Supernatural, real person fiction, was 27th. 66 of the top 100 ships were male, male, male slash male, and almost all the ships on the list are between white characters, too, and the shipping names, oh my god, the shipping names, Germione, Sky Solo, Storm Pilot, Sky DeLorean. Oh, so good. Germione, as in like Draco and Hermione? Oh, that's probably, that one and Dreary are probably the biggest Harry Potter ones, yeah. Okay, okay. So, obviously, there are some shippers that go as far as to attack creators and attackers if a ship doesn't go their way. Yeah, we definitely, I definitely watched that play it out for Supernatural. Oh, yeah. That was a huge thing. And believing uh -huh. their ship can only be enjoyed if it becomes canon, which, again, comes close to, especially when you have the male male, is it queer baiting? So there was yes. a conversation about that mm -hmm. too. Which leads to... OTP, the one true pairing. <laughs> so people can get really militant and defensive about this. I don't think there's a problem in like really shipping uh, OTP. That's so funny because in Atlanta, that means outside the perimeter. So I keep getting Right, that's up. why I'm, I'm being like, <laughs> what? What? But I mean, as long as you do it in good humor with the recognition that not everyone agrees with you and you don't own a fandom, like that militant attacking thing, that's not cool. One of the most troublesome elements of this hardcore shipping is hating on any other pairing. And that often involves hating on female characters. The amount of vitriol I've seen against Ginny Weasley mm -hmm. for getting in the way of whatever relationship the writer or reader thought should have been the OTP is just, it's shocking. It's shocking. Mm -hmm. And I've even seen authors be like, just Stop. It's called bashing. Stop Jenny bashing or stop. I don't want to be a part of this. She just isn't, doesn't have to be the romantic interest in this story, but calm down. <laughs> and these female characters are often written as outright evil shoes, like actually evil, like for Jenny, literally working for Voldemort or being worse than Voldemort. Like, Raleigh already kind of had an evil shrew in her book, which was Chang Cho. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, oh gosh. People don't really like her either, but pretty right. much any sure. female character that that's gets not, in the way. <laughs> that's not Hermione, but I know Cho was written in a way that she was kind of evil and like, not evil, yeah. but definitely annoying and shrill in the, in the book. With, I'm glad they did that less of that in the movie, but in the book, she sure was. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I did want to run through some random terms that do come up in these romantic senses. <laughs> if you don't know, writers can tag fan fiction with all kinds of things, which is one of my absolute favorite things is reading the tags. <laughs> so you can search that tag and get stories that have it. They can be really elaborate and funny. One of the most useful fanfic terms is UST. Like, I actually use this in real life. It's for unresolved sexual tension. Some other popular tags when it comes to romance are smut, which is essentially what it sounds like. Kink meme, also what it sounds like. PWP are porn without plot or porn what plot. Pining, slow burn slash build. Two idiots in love. Bed sharing. Oh no, one bed left. What are we going to do? Oh, oh yes. Then you're in love. Uh, a fluff, which is just sweet interactions. Not necessarily romantic, but often romantic. And that is actually the most popular tone, followed by angst. And I write both of those. So, hey, <laughs> hey. Are you wearing your shirt today since we're talking about it? No. <laughs> but sad. I should have. Yes. My, Samantha got me a lovely fan fiction shirt. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's about my fan fiction. Canon Divergent was the second most popular trope. And that's my current favorite thing, exactly for the example they gave. Quote, what if Luke was raised as the Prince of Alderaan and Leia as a lowly farm girl? But in terms of romance, these are interesting because authors get to mess or not mess with the OTP, the one true pairing. Were they destined to be together? Or in an alternate universe, would things have gone differently? I love that. I love exploring mm -hmm. that. Of course you do. So curtain fic, which is a genre of fan fiction that focuses on domestic situations. Apparently they're really cute. You they're think they're so really cute? cute? Yeah. I think they're so cute. All right. So it's called this because the situation might be two characters trying to decide on curtains for their home. The, so literal yeah. curtains. Okay. Yeah. Cool, cool, no, cool. it's like a, I, the first time I saw that, I thought it was going to be like really raunchy. <laughs> but no, it's like literally domestic, cute domestic situations. Right. Uh, I feel like that's happened to you a lot with this genre. Like you, you get really scared of looking at things up and it ends up being as innocent as it seems, as the title seems. I think I've like, carved out my world in fan fiction, so that's the case now. But when I was younger, that was not the case. I had a lot of learning to do. Like, we're not even talking about lemons. <laughs> no. Okay. Wow. Another episode. We'll come back to that. And yeah, right now, related to curtain fic, there's so much Luke Skywalker Mandalorian slash being written. And at first I was confused, but now I totally get it because they raise baby Yoda Grogu together and it's just sweet. It's cute. Another big segment of fan fiction, especially on things like Wattpad, are self-insert fics with celebrities. And this is real person fic or RPF. And I think this has to relate a lot to what we talked about in our fangirl episode of working through sexual desires, you're coming into adolescence, figuring out what these new feelings and wants mean. And not always, but I do think there's a big segment of that going on. And going back to, or well, we haven't talked about this yet, but in the future, when we talk about boy band and love ballads, this is an extension of that. Um, Wattpad is usually used by a younger female audience. And I wrote one of these for Green Day, Billy Joe Armstrong when I was in high school that involved me taking a bullet for him, which is a big trope in these. Like, you save their life. Sacrifice yourself. Yes. Them. And yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just for instance, like, Dean Winchester slash you was number 70 on that shipping chart, and Bucky slash you was 83. So you're writing yourself in with these characters. Oh, no Captain America? I'm sure he's on there, but he was <laughs> Bucky was first oh, okay, before he okay. was. <laughs> Well, we do have a little bit more for you listeners, but first we have one more quick break for a word from our sponsor. And we're back. Thank you, sponsor. So, uh, one big thing I've never explored in fan fiction is the Omegaverse, or A, B, O, A slash B slash O. And this is a universe based on a werewolf hierarchy where you have alphas, betas, and omegas, and sometimes gammas, deltas, and sigmas. But there doesn't have to be a mention of werewolves. This universe can be applied to any fandom. So, alphas are the highest rank. Uh, they're very protective and aggressive, and they usually have something that sets them apart, often a knot on the base of the penis, or if it's a woman, a retractable penis. Female alphas have no womb and can't get pregnant, um, and this is used to lock an omega in place during sex so that it can catch. Alphas have a distinct scent that might cause omegas to go into heat and or induce arousal. Alphas are always on top during sex. 
So I have to ask you this because you are really worried about researching this. Yes. How do you feel about it now? It's not as bad as I thought it would be. And okay. I, to anybody who likes it, I only mean that because I some of the descriptions I've read, I was like, oh, this is going to be like really feral, violent sex. Yeah, right. That's what I, I thought it was right. going to be. Like very triggering type of sex. That, that yeah. Not necessarily something you would want. But yeah, no, we talked about this. So betas are pretty much human, except for a few things, which makes sense. They do have a bit of a scent, but not too much. Oh, it was a good scent. Uh, <laughs> they can't get pregnant after sex with alphas, and they can't impregnate omegas. I guess that's good news. Female betas are also pretty much, quote, normal humans, so they can have their period and can get pregnant, even with alphas. Though, of course, the process is painful, um, and their scent is soothing to omegas and alphas. Okay. (laughs) Uh, And omegas, uh, they go into heat. Basically, their fertility goes up and their sexual arousal goes wild. Female omegas are the same as humans, but male omegas use their anal canal both for waste and essentially as a uterus, and they usually have to have a C-section when giving birth. Omegas in heat become very sensitive to scent, uh, irritable, they get elevated temperatures, heavy breathing, and secretions of slick are a sweet-smelling self-lubricant. They usually are looking for an alpha to, quote, not them, and that's K-N-O-T if that wasn't clear. And alphas and omegas, quote, mark each other with a bite to the space between the neck and the shoulder. So these are specifically used for, I guess, like creatures or monsters, alien, outer space type of fiction? Oh, no. Like, no? Uh, this could be, like I said, I just saw one in Star Wars where it was like Obi-Wan was an Omega and Anakin was an Alpha. Like, and they okay. did apply it to like any characters. Okay, interesting. So this sounds familiar, obviously, to a sub-dom or submissive and dominant relationship. But when surveyed by Omegaverse, it seems popular among one particular group, while most surveyed did not like it. And you were hesitant about it because this is not necessarily up your alley either, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I said, I was just worried it was going to be kind of this really violent, Mm non-consensual sex, which I'm sure does happen in this universe, but doesn't necessarily (laughs) have to be the case. But speaking of, we did want to talk about dubcon and non-con, which is dubious consent and non-consensual. So... I wanted to put this in here because I have read a lot of fan fiction in my day, if that's not obvious. But there, there's a lot of cases where this leads to romance with the character that sexually assaulted another character, which of course is very problematic and worrisome when it comes to how people perceive romance. In fact, at least in the ones I've read, the aggressor often gets some tragic or even romantic reasoning so that you're meant to feel sympathetic for him and that it's probably the girl or woman's fault or even other or other man's fault. On the other hand, dub slash non-con is often used to facilitate a relationship between someone else. So sometimes that can be a healthy thing, like being there for someone who has been through a trauma. I have written one of those. But often it's done unhealthily, as in the dub slash non-con took place to punish the other man slash interested party. So this person that was assaulted is essentially just a pawn to punish someone else. And dubcon is in specific, frequently used as a way to imply that the character being taken advantage of actually does want it, in heavy quotes. And the assaulting character knows this and is just giving the character what they want. And yes, romance might ensue from there. Uh, And this is a very complicated conversation, but I do think there's a layer of women and girls feeling like they can't voice what they want sexually or admit that they have sexual desires because it might make them a slut and or not really knowing what they do want and relinquishing control to someone else. I'm not saying I condone it. Consent, enthusiastic consent, always. (laughs) Just that I think that that might be at play. And as I said, a decent amount of fan fiction is women and girls and queer people working out their thoughts around sex and romance and love. And I've heard a debate around the use of these terms at all, as in they're softening what they really are, which is sexual assault and rape. (laughs) But I've seen other people argue that these are good because they aren't as triggering for people who are just scrolling through. Like, you can see that and be like, okay, that story's not for me. And again, this kind of does relay with a lot of the novel stuff we're talking about and how it's aged and trying to figure out what women want. And during the time where sexuality was repressed for women, that also had this whole layer of like wanting this level of like, conversation of dominating or being uh, being subdued somehow or something along those lines of uh, being swept off their feet because it was this level of how do I talk about sexuality? I can't say I want it, so it right. has to be this. So it definitely goes hand in hand in, in that conversation about what is this timeline? What does this look like? And who is talking about it? 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's a very complex situation. I know we kind of touched on it again in our, our Women in Monsters episode, Women Heart Monsters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's complicated. There's a lot to untangle there. And on a chart of most popular versus least popular tropes in fan fiction, non-con was the second least popular after underage and before incest. Uh, people also weren't into pregnancy or impreg. But of note, I would say those are things people probably are more hesitant to say that they read. <laughs> I mean, I believe it's true, but also... (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. They might not shout it from, this is my favorite genre, or this is my favorite grouping. Right. Yeah, so woo! That's what we have to say in our part one of Women and Romance. Yes, and we've got more, and it's... Yes. Annie's all into the video game part, too. She's Mm -hmm. already ready for this. But we're going to be talking about movies, TV, video games, and yes, even music and boy bands, because there's a lot to unravel. And yes, we know this is very broad, but we did want to look at (laughs) what it looks like on these levels. And we've already talked about fangirls before, and we've talked a little bit about video games before, women in video games. So this is not new. We just wanted to talk about it in reference to romance. So stay tuned, or come back, rather, for part two. (laughs) Or stay tuned, depending yeah, on no. where you're listening. Yeah, when you're listening to this, I don't know. <laughs> yes. Um, in the meantime, if you have any uh, romance recommendations, oh my goodness, send them our way. <laughs> our email is stuffmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can also find us on Instagram at Stuff Mom Never Told You or on Twitter at Mom Stuff Podcast. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thanks, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff Mom Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 